Welcome. It's really my honor today to have a conversation with Dr. Jean Sinkford, uh, who really needs no introduction, but I'll give a brief one. Uh, Dr. Sinkford is originally from Washington, D.C. area, and she went to Howard University for her undergraduate work in psychology and chemistry and then went on to Howard for dental school and became a faculty member after her graduation, but also practiced part-time in private practice. And then she decided to go on and get her PhD in physiology from Northwestern and also did a residency in pediatric dentistry. In 1975, Jean became the Dean of the Dental School at Howard. And at that time, she was the first female Dean of any dental school in the United States. And she served in that role until 1991. And after that, she joined the American Dental Education Association in, um, in, in several leadership roles, including uh, she directed the Center for Equity and Diversity until really just uh, recently has served the ADEA. She's had numerous awards and recognitions, including uh, she's a fellow in the American College of Dentists, the International College of Dentists, the National Academy of Medicine. She has received many honors, including a Distinguished Service Award from the American Dental Association. I could go on and on, but I wanna make sure we have time to have conversation. So um, let me just say, Thank you, Dr. Sinkford. Can I call you Jean? Yeah, please call me Jean. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. And, um, you know, this is part of a, a leadership series. Um, I, I also have to highlight that um, Jean has received numerous honorary degrees from uh, a variety of universities, including the University of Michigan. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But um, that makes you an alumna of the University of Michigan, which is um, a very cool and, and highlights um, a nice link. So let's start and just ask you how you decided to go into dentistry to begin with. I decided to go into dentistry because I was recruited by my family dentist. He knew that I had good hands and that I was thinking about going into medicine but I married early and he left that out. <laughs> I met my love of my life, my junior year in college. And so he was going to go to medical school and I did not want to be in a competitive role in our marriage. So when I was offered the uh, scholarship to dental school, uh, I, 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 I was so thrilled because I could go to dental school. And not only that, but I was going to have full tuition. And that was a, a, a important to me too, because my family uh, had supported me, my ideas, but we had did not have money enough for me to continue another four years uh, without some kind of help. So that helped, uh, helped me make a decision that, hey, you're going to go to dental school and you're going to find, you want, you're interested in research because my senior year in high school, I was able to do some research and then I went to NIH uh, on a rotation and I really wanted to go there. That was where I wanted to go and to do research. But uh, I did get that chance when I was in, in uh, dental school also. My junior, between my junior and senior years, I got to do a research project with a research scholar and then publish that, that work that I did. So. So it kind of worked really very well with, um, and you're saying my, my granddaughter isn't sure what she wants to do. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do because I wanted to be a dancer. You know, I'd studied ballet so, so rigorously and I wanted to New York, go to New York. I had won a scholarship to New York and my mother said, no, you're not, you're not going to be a dancer because you, you have too, too much to offer. So it really, uh, worked out very well for me to live at home and go to school with, with, because we could afford it and then look forward to going up later. And that opportunity came. And I think that's your, your next question. Yeah. My dean. So, so were you, were you and your husband in professional school at the same time then? Yes, he was in uh, medical he, school. He, and... he was in medical school ahead of uh -huh. me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and and you mentioned your granddaughter, so I have to um, highlight that that's yet another connection with Michigan because your granddaughter is a rising sophomore at rising Michigan, sophomore. an undergrad. Yeah. And she got all A's, by the way. She didn't tell me that. That's no, awesome. I, I don't think she knew because she hadn't gotten all of her grades back. Okay. And she said, Grandma, guess what? And I was just so proud of her because she... She uh, she had one course that she was worried about, and she even got to aim that course. <laughs> so that was That's great. awesome. Uh, so 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 the next question is how you decided to go into an academic path instead of going into private practice. Although I know you did practice part time. I did. Uh -huh. Yeah. How you decided to go on faculty? I I like teaching, and I think during my uh, years as a dental student, many of the students would come to me to explain things that they didn't quite understand, and I would brief them, and also I would give them my notes, okay, and we would talk from my notes. So I found myself doing much of um, trying to re enrich them. They were always smart, but they just, we had so many courses during the first two years, as you know, anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, pharmacy, all the three things. I mean, it was kind of overwhelming for students who had only been taking 15 talk hours in, in, in undergraduate school. So it's kind of an overwhelming thing. And they, they really uh, just needed the, uh, the tutelage that uh, I felt helped me learn, understand better because when you teach, you, you learn also but also, I I, uh, I wanted to go away to school, and I, I wanted the dean. Um, I, I graduated. I practiced for two years part time after I left, and I and I was on the faculty, so I had a chance to do some teaching, clinical teaching as a faculty member, and also I was interested in being an orthodontist. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> at, that, at that time, I the the. the uh, my dean said, well, I need a prosthodontist, okay? So when I went away to school, he, he allowed me to make that kind of decision. I taught prosthodontics while I was a graduate student. I got my credentials for, for, for uh, my degree, my advanced degree, which, I, which allowed me to envision myself being a member of the graduate faculty. I wanted to be a dental faculty, but I also wanted to be a graduate faculty. Mm -hmm. And I had to have the PhD to be a graduate faculty member. And that's still true today. I, I'm the only dental faculty member that ha that is also a member of the graduate faculty at, at Howard. And, and I think that that was very Wait, You were the first or the only, or you- well, Only, first and only, because I was I was the one that challenged, and challenged the opportunity because I had to have graduate sponsorship. I had to have a PhD physiologist that would would recommend that I become a, be accepted as a as a faculty member in the graduate school at Howard University. Wow! So I really was a trailblazer there, and I didn't know that was what I was doing. Except I wanted to be at the table. When I sat at the table, yeah. I didn't want to be them looking down at me because I was a dentist and not the scientist that I really wanted to be. And I've gotten that, some experience and exposure when I went out to NIH and I saw the difference between the clinicians and also the, the, the basic science faculty and how the two of them had to work together. And I wanted to be both. That's why I get, had to get my clinical ISPA uh, specialty uh, training also. So I could be a clinician as well as a basic scientist. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It was, it was amazing because because my father said, "Are you ever going to finish?" <laughs> you know, I, my parents said the same thing yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. I said, Are, "Is that child ever going to finish?" <laughs> but I, I I realized early that it would all it would mean a lifetime career in in learning, uh, and, it, and it was not something that you would get finished with, but you would go to the next level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, share a few photos here. Uh, the first is this, which I think it, uh, it is famous, one of my favorite 
when you were on the cover of Jet. Yes, that was. Um, nice. that and was it, nice. says, it says Dr. Jean Singford. She is the first lady to top dental class at Howard in 73 years. My guess is that that was the first ever, right? right. I mean, <laughs> That's right. That was the first ever. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't, it doesn't just say the first ever, but um, anyways, you, it, it's pretty amazing. You graduated first in your dental class. And yeah. so I, I'm curious, what was it like? You know, I, I assume there weren't many women in your class at all. No, no, there weren't. Um, but to be one of very few women in the profession and to be considered a better student than your male counterparts. And, and in general, you know, what was your motivation to excel like that? But then how did you also feel about that? Well, it, uh, it was very challenging, number one, because I didn't see myself as a female, okay? I saw myself as a scholar or a good student. And that I had been challenged by my high school teachers because all of us, 98% of my, I went to black high school, number one, and I wanted to mention that Dunbar mm -hmm. High School was a very unique uh, school for minority students. And all of the teachers encouraged us to do our best to, you're going to be competing across the board. Most of us wanted to go to Ivy League schools and, and, and they were making it possible for us to go because they helped us with our applications and we helped us with mentoring. So, so I was at, at that level when I was, when I was in um, at the, the College of Dentistry, it was just a continuation of what I, I had already done and what I, I guess I was destined to do because I, I saw that as an opportunity, but also as a need. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought, I thought uh, uh, related to that, that question also, there were only 5% uh, of the women in dental school at that time, 5% uh, of the, uh, of the enrollees within dental school at that time were women. And many of the dental schools were not even admitting women. Yeah, I'm surprised it was even 5%. That's what I understand. At, yeah. It was 5% uh, when you included the foreign foreign students. I think it was 2% if you were only talking about American students. And okay. I, so like, how, do how many students were in the dental class at Howard then? About 45. Oh, so. And, yeah, but we had five women. Two were from... Uh, one was from Latvia and one was from Lithuania. So my class, my classes, by the way, were very, very diverse at Howard. Howard had a national uh, attraction for foreign students. Mm. So we all always had students from other countries that we learned to work with and talk with, but also uh, we had appreciation for what they brought to the academic environment. Had they had they been trained as dentists oh, yeah, in they, another they, country? Yes, they were. Yeah. Dentists. And Howard had to put a program in place where they could uh, take uh, academic and clinical uh, subjects and qualify for board examinations. So it was like an advanced standing. It was an advanced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. It was really amazing because they they were good. They were good dentists. The women that they were in our classes. I mean, they were excellent practitioners. But they were good with patients, so we got we got to learn a lot about just interfacing with them. Mm -hmm. So, I also love this picture, um, and it reminds me to ask you about. Um, you know, I already highlighted that you were the first female dean of a dental school in the U.S., but I would love to hear you just kind of compare and contrast the leadership roles of being a dean of a dental school versus the leadership role that you engaged with the ADEA, which was a, a national, you know, more focused, but a national leadership role. Right. Um, the, the, the leadership role at the college, the, the issues were very much the same, but the style was very different. I when I became the dean of the dental school, I did not want a top-down leadership. 
I wanted a, a, a collaborative leadership. So it meant that I had to build the infrastructure I needed to be effective. It meant that we had to have a, te a training program at all academic levels, mm -hmm. but it also meant that we needed to be able to send the individuals that were going to be uh, evaluating students the credentials that they needed. So we had a Louise Ball Fellowship Program, and I, I'm, I'm happy to say her name because she was a Columbia graduate, but she left a large endowment to Howard's College of Dentistry, which we were able to use to train faculty. And many other schools did not have faculty development. And we, I, we did, I, in fact, not only faculty development, but how the faculty evaluated each other and how they were the comp compensation or reward for good teaching and excellence in students. So all of that became built into the, the program at, at Howard while we were still confined to the rigid hierarchy that's set up in schools. We had, we had to have academic credentials and they had to move up from one rank to the other. We didn't, weren't able to, to uh, bypass the hierarchy that was in academia and it's still a lot there. Uh, even uh, differentiation between the clinical professors versus the professors, right? The clinical de designation for titles. So it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was, but it was very different when I went to Adia because we were a business then, okay? And the business strategies then but I had, had, I had had to learn a lot of those also as the dean of a dental school because I had to manage uh, uh, monies, I had to recruit, I had to, uh, uh, I had to interface with the, with the board of trustees. I had to, uh, so when you, when you think about all of the skills that you had to have or develop as a, an effective dean, I only took those to a deal but there was no infrastructure there. There was no uh, minority program. There was no uh, diversity program. There was, and in fact, there were no funds. I had to raise some funds. And also what we did have was um, a, a, committee, a committee that had looked into the need to have change. And that committee um, uh, had left some recommendations that Adia didn't know what to do with, okay? So I said, well, I'll start. I'm not going to stay here. That was the first thing. I was not going to stay there. I did, I stayed there. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, you stayed there for what, 25 years yeah, yeah. or something? That's how he recruited me. But he said, if you will just walk us through, teach us what you have learned being at a minority institution with, with diversity issues and having overcome much of that how can, how can we implement some of these things? And so I said, well, first of all, I've got to be able to know that I have some freedom in my decisions that I would not be answering to somebody, but I would be, I would want my outcomes to be measurable by other people. So that I, I wanted, I wanted to have my, a chance to develop a, a diversity program at there and as it, as it grew, it was not just uh, diversity for minorities, but it was women. At the same time, women were at, they, I mean, we, we, we assumed that we were getting more women, but the opportunities for advancement in women were not happening. Mm -hmm. And so I had to find a, a way to have a program for the leadership of women without it being exclusive and not available to males. So that was how why we began building uh, fa faculty leadership period across the board. And the models that I was able to raise money to establish uh, were for, for, for males, females, and gender was not the issue. But excellence was the issue and, and being able to develop academic community partnerships and also uh, the uh, issues, the major issues that we were dealing with like access to care and and uh, research development. Mm -hmm. It must be really rewarding for you to look back at oh, that, is. you know, from taking that from nothing. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and it's really robust. 
now. It's a really robust activity at ADEA. Oh, it, 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 it is wonderful. And what is so wonderful about it is that the individuals that are now in charge now value what we had to come through, okay? Because when we first started that, many of the schools, the dental deans did not want to hear that, okay? Mm -hmm. They were comfort, they, we were taking them out of their comfort zone. And not only that, but we were not, we did not give them what they needed to move ahead. You know, they wanted to hire a minority uh, associate deans or, 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 or administrators, but they didn't, they weren't, they weren't there. They just weren't there. There wasn't a pool. So we had to begin training and we did the minority development programs for about five years and we got some support from, from, uh, from um, a couple of the companies that were very, uh, PNG and especially all along the way when we asked PNG because PNG as a company had already decided that they would be a better company if they had diversity, if they if they help, but they had to help train the people to be, you know. So so that it, it, and I had that model, and I never will forget Mike Sazena uh, because he said, "I want you to give them the model for for dentistry," and I had to develop a model that he could show his board. And also, and uh, also have some measurable outcomes, so that we could say, hey, you know, a few of the dental schools get this, a few don't, but this is the direction that we're going to have to move. And it was really, it was, it was wonderful to see what that little bit of money was able to leverage. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was a few million dollars, but I think uh, the schools that actually responded and Michigan was one of them. Michigan was always among, among the schools that would take their meager resources and spread them so it could be better or it could be, it'd be more inclusive or more effective. So I was really, I was just so thrilled that I had the opportunity to do that because I, every time I opened one door, there was another door that needed to be shut. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a never ending that's right, right. But they've got a wonderful staff there. They've got great ideas. They're using contemporary ways of, of delivery. And also they also have a broad context uh, as well as concept. And so many stakeholders, so oh, yeah. many stakeholders oh, yeah. involved in that. Yes, yes. Yeah. We, had, we had to build that, we had to build that, you know, and we called it, we had a, had a, had a beautiful, um, model that showed all of our stakeholders and it was always so um impressive to me because we could show it to other people that it's it's brought it's growing it's growing it was not shrinking it was growing <laughs> well i'm gonna show a couple other photos here um you you have been a fabulous Oh, wow. partner to Michigan visiting us on multiple occasions as a distinguished speaker and honorary degree recipient. This is from just a couple different occasions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, our, our dear colleague, Marilyn Wolfel, Rita Inglehart, Todd Esther. Um, and then this shows in 2018 when you received your honorary degree from the University of Michigan, which um, it's just a, a wonderful memory to me. I know you've received honorary degrees from, uh, from several different universities, but uh, obviously this is a very special one uh, for, for me. Um, I wanna also show the video that our university made um, when you received your award. As a child, Dr. Jean Craig Sinkford did not know any women dentists, but she knew the profession was an option thanks to the encouragement she received from her own dentist. This early mentorship would inspire her studies and career, and she became the first female dean of an American dental school. Dr. Sinkford has helped to break down the financial, social, and educational barriers that have prevented members of minority communities and women from entering dental careers by creating innovative pipeline programs and faculty development. 
She has also worked to promote social justice, serving on the Tuskegee Syphilis Study Ad Hoc Advisory Panel, which developed policies to protect the rights of human subjects in health research. Dr. Sinkford's pursuit of excellence is revealed through her innovative research on wound healing and on the biocompatibility of implants and human tissue. Her inspiring leadership has enriched the dental profession, leading colleagues to describe Dr. Jean Craig Sinkford as a coalition builder and a giant to dental education. So that's just a, a piece of the video uh, that the an intro portion of the video talks about some of the other people who received honorary degrees from the University of Michigan, like Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela, <laughs> George Bush. So, I mean, I always think, you know, how cool is this that, you know, you, Jean Sinkford is right up there as one of our distinguished honorary degree recipients. I, I thought that was outstanding. It really was. But it was just as outstanding for me to get an honorary degree from Howard University because it, it, they waited until Michigan had given one. Oh, is that right? I, was, I, I had received them from Michigan. And, and really, they do not give many honorary degrees to their graduates. They're reaching out, you know, they're reaching sure. out to the honor. Uh, but the, I thought that. It was very, it was uh, amazing that I received that one from Michigan before Howard recognized me. <laughs> well, we like to think we're leaders. <laughs> but I, I, I really, I really thought it was, it was, it was breathtaking for me to hear that I, that had been, occurred. And I understood that I'd only been the second dentist to receive that award at Michigan. And yeah. It was. It was quite profound for me. It was a cold day, as I oh, remember. Oh, that was that, that, oh, <laughs> we, were, we were freezing. Oh, yeah. it really was. It really was. And it's always, you know, in the football stadium. So it was out of course. Stadium, but, that yeah. awesome stadium that's there. It was just <laughs> awesome. It was just beautiful. So we were talking about you know, comparing and contrasting these leadership roles. And I wonder if you would just comment on you know, from your great perspective, what you think the leadership challenges are in dental education, what they are now, and have they changed over the last 50 years? I think they have changed, but they're very much the same. And I think that the, the changes are due to the um, technology and also uh, what is expect expected of health professions in general, not just dentistry, but how are we going to reach uh, uh, confined disease? How are we going to share information? How are we going to train a diverse workforce? All of those issues are not new issues because I've looked back at the, at the uh, study that, uh, that the Institute of Medicine did a few years ago, uh, in education at the crossroads yeah, and which was it, in the 90s. Yeah, it was yeah. in the 90s. But if you do, if you go back there, the same issues are talked and, and you still have to find ways to deal with those issues. And the competition, for me, it was the competition for gifted minority students, especially when everybody then wanted to find minorities to hire and they weren't contributing to the pool. So the, the, the pipeline is something that not, it's not just dentistry, but it's all of the health professions. The pool is small unless we begin to see and, and, and pathways in which we can help students, not just black students, but all students get through because we're losing talent in this country by seg segregated in, uh, schools and, and communities but also not realizing that growth occurs very early in, 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 in uh, uh, the, uh, the desire to be great and the desire to, to stick in it, uh, desire to, to, to put the work in that goes into the outcomes is, is individual, but it doesn't happen overnight. It happens because you have a vision and you have support. So we have to have the support for early so students will see themselves 
not as outliers, but as part of the of, of, of the growth that this country needs. And we've got it. We've got to move fast because uh, I'm so interested in what they're doing in New York with robotics and what we're doing with our, our research um, collaborations. That's why that's why I saw us going to uh, international leadership training programs. Um, and before, and I, I just to stuck stuck my neck out there because I wanted, I knew that we needed to have women meeting women because I really feel that the health of the of the world is almost in the hands of the women. And it's because we are, we are the breeders and we're also the caregivers and whatever happens in our communities, uh, uh, we have to be a part of. And so it took the Institute of Medicine a long time to find, figure that out. And they found that, that we have a major role and it's not, it's not a subversive role, but it is a role, a, a role that's necessary for the uh, humankind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's a, a recent article in the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at diversity across the health professions. And, and, you know, pretty much the conclusion is we don't have enough diversity in our healthcare workforce. Right. But it was the first time I had seen, you know, recent data comparing medicine and nursing and dentistry and I'll just say that um, we did not, we do not look good. Relative. No, we don't, but I mean, health affairs don't look good, you know? No, no. If, if, if you look at all, you can say the same thing across all the health professions. Yeah. So I, when we started recruiting the pipeline piece, we were trying to get more minorities into dentistry, but the pipeline really needs to be fed across the board now, okay? And yeah, that, uh, uh, the academic health centers now is looking across the disciplines to uh, to more coordination between the training programs that we're establishing individually. More and also, when when we started recruit our programs, we didn't care if they were going into medicine or dentistry or, but we wanted them to get the background that they needed mm -hmm. to make choices once they. Uh, once they got the training. So we had a broad concept there. And so it, it, I think it's, it's working. I think the challenges are very much uh, the same, but there are opportunities now. And that's what makes me feel good. I think we, yeah. we've got a, a larger, um, we've got the, the, uh, the challenges greater and also the, the risks are still there. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it seems like to me in higher ed, we're very good at addressing things that are that we can tweak yeah, in college or professional school, but we're not very good at addressing things that need to be addressed much earlier, right? In the lifespan, and and I, I'm just curious to hear from you. I, it seems to me that we need much more work much earlier. Yes, you know, for us to tackle this issue that if we wait until it's, you know, who presents at our door, it's too late. It is too late. And that's what I hope I got across earlier. You've got to start early. You've got to uh, not only with the, with the schools, but the communities, mm -hmm. and all of the resources, is, I, and I call them interested parties because Foundations will have to come up with with, with training funds. Uh, the uh, training programs are going to have to be more inclusive. Uh, we will have to stop uh, isolating uh, uh, communities because they are poor communities. The teachers have got to be spread out more. We can use more. Uh, com um, your your uh, technology can help us though. But we've got we've got to train the teachers to use the technology, and we've got to be sure that they're in the communities and at an early level, because we know that if they get to the eighth grade, and and, and they're taking the, the math courses, that they they don't have the skills to understand and move forward. You've lost them, mm -hmm. uh, that, and that that has been proven. So we knew, even in my programs that I had. 
we wanted some of the schools to see if they could extend their outreach down to lower. But see, the schools also have have limited resources. Some of the schools yeah. did do that, but I mean, it's not just us trying to do it, it's the nation trying to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're currently trying to partner with um, our School of Ed in a program in Detroit that's a K through 12 program uh -huh. Uh -huh. where we will have a dental clinic and provide care, but also use that as a segue into you know, educating an underserved population of the potential careers that they could engage in. Well, you, you, all, you also have that program, uh, a model there at, at your school already from your that, huh? because Our you Profiles know, for Success program. You're going, you were yeah. thinking about maybe you could go up to upper, you had a, a native uh, community north of uh, Detroit area that uh, really needed, uh, then I had a group down in uh, Alabama that was asked, can we have some dental students here to help us, you know, because they needed the, uh, the, in, the even just uh, screenings for them and, and preventive care. So I think we can do a lot more with what we have, but we just have to have the, um, have the vision that if we, we can't, we can't continue to do what we're doing, we gotta do, something better. So what, what areas do you think have the greatest potential for impact in our profession in the future? Um, I think, um, well, the, well, the, the uh, coronavirus has told us that, you know, we need to get a handle on infection control. And I think we were leaders in, in fact, I know we were leaders in infection control. Mm -hmm. And because we, when, when they have had the first AIDS epidemic in this country, we were the ones that, that helped establish the guidelines, the wearing of the mask and the distancing and the gloves. And we were more serious than the medical because when I think the medical, general students or the medical school, medical school is still running around handling having no idea that they were spreading the disease as, yeah. as, uh, as uh, because because uh, nobody had made it important. But I, I, I really think to say that, I think I think we've got to look at the, uh, and I said robotics also, because I think yeah. we need to take a look at how we can uh, expand the, the uh, work of the, of the professional, the technical skills, and then something can be transferred to a lesser, uh, more uh, routine operation as we can do with, with, with the robots. Mm -hmm. uh, also, distance learning is, is also a, a, to reach, uh, especially in continuing education and also in, uh, in recruitment. I think uh, the use of the computing technology for distance learning is a great well, These large, uh, massive, open online yeah. communication can right. mm -hmm. reach huge numbers of people all over the world. Right, right. And then which, I um, I, I'll, I'll just put a plug in because we have a Dentistry 101 course. Oh, great. Oh, do you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and see that, and see the kids may never have heard of it until yeah. you expose them to it. I remember when I went to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, the, the kids, were the first, they, it was the first time they had seen a woman dentist, you know? Mm -hmm. And I told them, you know, I said, well, you know, because I said, you have to talk. There are dentists around, but you need to invite them in here so you, you can talk to them and get to know them so they can help advise you on the pathway that you're going to have to follow to uh, achieve what you uh, would uh, desire. Mm -hmm. So I think that was that, that's the kind of thing that we really have to do, reaching back and reaching forward. But I thought one other concept I thought we, to answer your question I think we need to uh, expand uh, public health and preventive concepts across the board. I think that uh, we need to have uh, pay this service to public health concepts. And I think if we can uh, let the communities understand that if, if we live more uh, uh, protective lives, if, if we try to involve the individuals with their own health instead of trying to wait till something happens and then treat them, I think that we are, are will, will be way ahead of the game, but we've already been doing that. You know, we have been doing it for the dentistry because I remember years ago, somebody said to me, 
a physician said, yours is the only profession that's trying to put itself out of business. And I said, yeah, but I mean, we still have, <laughs> we, we still have plenty have of business. Right, we still have plenty. Yeah, think of how bad things would be if we yeah. weren't doing that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, uh, you know, many of the people listening to this could will be students. And I'm curious if you have any advice to dental students who may be interested in leadership paths in their careers. What advice would you have for them? I think they're at a very nice uh, area in, in the crossroad road right now. Because we're talking about interprofessional education, IPE, and collaborative care. And we have never addressed this. We have been so isolated in identifying you want to be a nurse or you want to be a hygienist or you want to be, but we're talking about now working in teams. And so I think that the, the young people need to, uh, first of all, read. Okay, <laughs> read everything that, like my mother said, I want to see you with a book in your hand, okay? <laughs> Uh, we all, but there also the the uh, the uh, there are a lot of uh, information uh, uh, access uh, through your television and through your broadcasting now, but it needs to be directed. But I do think that the reading or uh, developing communication skills is number two. I think because I find that uh, minority students have a tendency to stand back and and be told or talked. To, mm -hmm. rather than expressing or encouraged to, to ask a question. No question is stupid. You know, I want them to feel, I mean, I want that, that to get be gotten across to young children. Ask a question if you have it. And don't be put down because somebody doesn't think it's a serious question because many of the great questions come from a simple question that a young person asks that uh, can be uh, developed into a much more complex issue I think and then I think um, be a good follower always you know learn to uh, learn to follow before you lead because you're going to have to reach down and pull up and then last of all I think uh, kids early should begin looking at multiple mentors okay yeah. they uh, uh, parents begin mentoring and then uh, teachers begin mentoring but as you get higher up and, and more direct as to where you want to be and where you want to go, it, does, it means that you need to be looking at mentors or people that can help you or advise you because everything is getting so very complex. And the roles are changing. I mean, the, the roles are, are converging. You know, it's not just a, a physician, but a physician um, internist. I mean, I mean, all of the, uh, all of the, uh, uh, opportunities that are emerging from new science and different and and, and people need different mentors for different right. aspects of their career path right absolutely right? yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there anything else that you would like to add for our students no i just want to wish them well because i think it uh it's going to be difficult for the, the cost of the, the cost. But I think the rewards and outcomes outweigh the cost. And we just have to find ways to help finance so that we can have mm -hmm. access available to individuals that want to be dentists who will help, help uh, improve the health of, and welfare of, of underserved people and also will encourage students and be mentors also. Yeah, you know, they, uh, I know we all are well aware of how much it costs to go to dental school and the, and the indebtedness of our students. Mm -hmm. I just saw this week the data from our class that just graduated in 2021. And I, I'm pleased to say that for the third year in a row, the average indebtedness of our students has gone down. Oh, it's, that's it's one area that we are below the average across the U.S. And I say, you know, it's one of the few areas that I'm happy to be below average. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's yeah. outstanding. It really is because the, the, the drivers of, of the uh, tuition increases 
have not gone down. Yeah. So you must have been able to find other resources to offset that those, those tuition. Mm -hmm. We've been working really hard in uh, philanthropy to support scholarships and fellowships and yeah. Well, congratulations to you. Thank that you. ought to be front page. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, the the dilemma is it's still too much, right? Yeah. Well, it is, yeah. uh, you know, because you almost want to whisper it, right? <laughs> right, right. I really want to say, is that it? Mean it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to start talking about how it's worth the time and the effort and the, yes. the joys that uh, you, you get. Yeah and fulfillment but uh it's it's really hard to when you're talking to uh, inner city kids you know when when they're trying to find the next meal and and jobs the um uh, yeah disappearing or and or, when you talk about cost it's more yeah. than just financial yeah, it it right is. it really so, is uh -huh. yeah well gene it's always a delight to talk <laughs> with you Thank you so much. I have to say, when I spoke with your granddaughter, she asked me, you know, how do you, you know, how is it that you know my grandmother? <laughs> and I said to her, I said, well, you know, she may be, you know, just a grandmother to you, but to the rest of us, she's like an incredibly famous and, and, and a, a wonderful role model. And I, always enjoy spending time with you. I always learn something from you. And I just so appreciate all you've done for our profession. Well, now, Laurie, I want to tell you also, you are one of my favorite deans, okay? <laughs> because you have taken on on the Michigan mandate, okay? And you, when I was a dean, we could always send students to Michigan when other schools were not accepting them, okay? They had to be qualified, but that was a resource that we knew that if we wanted a faculty that had the, had the advanced learning, that that was the school that they could go to and they would be welcome. Yeah, I would. I welcome getting right. you know graduate students right. uh, who may want to go back to Howard and teach. Right, I love that. Yeah, and they came back with that idea. And I, I, one of my uh, dear friends who was, did his orthodontics at Michigan died recently, and he he, all, he always said the opportunity that he had to get his training at at Michigan was was almost unbelievable. Okay, because other schools were, uh, were the, well. First of all, the numbers of, of training slots were you know were so few, and the, uh, those that got the tra training slots. Were, were, um, were already in the pipeline. So it was, it was very hard to get into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity to, to talk with you. You're always, a, 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 I, just, I just think you're such a marvelous dean. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Jean. Mm -hmm. um, you're a, a great colleague and friend. I appreciate it. Thank you so much thank for you. this interview. Thank you.